Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, we are going to talk about the stories we create, the narratives we create, the way we make meaning out of what we experience. So there is a big differentiation between you know, all kinds of mental processes and between what we feel, what we experience in the moment, and then uh, how we remember it, what we think it means, how we make sense out of it. Uh, and both of these systems, which date back to Plato and all the way up to a recent book called Thinking Fast and Slow, uh, are as old as time and as difficult for us to step back, think about, and be choiceful about. So with that, uh, let us begin. Well, the first time I ever came across this idea was I was reading and somebody quoted in Proverbs, as a man thinks in his heart, so mm-hmm. is he. Mm-hmm. And, that, and mm-hmm. I came across that in my teenage years when I was getting involved in kind of mysticism. And it was the first time that I really came to appreciate that there is a profound relationship between the way I think about myself and things and how the world is shaped around me. Yeah. And that was a revelation as a, as a kid that I had never heard such a thing. That's great. Mm-hmm. That's great. Mm-hmm. You know, Teb, you mentioned Plato and, and Joseph, you mentioned the Old Testament. And, you know, there's some thinking about this that, that you know, Carl Jaspers coined the term the axial age. And it was this time period, you know, sort of roughly around 800 BCE when all of these wisdom traditions were beginning, both you know, Plato and, and the Old Testament and, and also Persian Zoroastrianism, uh, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism in China. And, and a lot of these uh, thought systems uh, br- bring in this idea of kind of second order thinking or being able to think about thinking or thinking about the consequences of things. <laughs> and there's this growing awareness of our minds, of the importance of mind. And our mind's ability to create mm-hmm. illusion, that's in some of these thought systems. And Joseph, it's just kind of perfect what, what you mentioned. Um, there's this, uh, this book of Buddhist wisdom. It's the sayings of the Buddha called the Dhammapada, and it's from 1500 BCE. And I just want to share a couple of uh, the things, uh, the, the, the um, quotes from it. Um, Just as rain breaks through an ill-thatched house, so passion penetrates an undeveloped mind. Mm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And even mind precedes all mental states. Mm. Mind is the chief. They are all mind rot. If with an impure mind a person speaks or acts, suffering follows him like the wheel that follows the foot of an ox. Mm. So it's you're right. It is a revelation to really, really get how much our thoughts shape things. And of course, this is uh, the central insight, I think most people would agree with me with this, behind cognitive behavioral therapy that it really aims to challenge your thoughts. Yes. Uh, What what I'm thinking about to contribute to the, you know, sort of the history of all this as a great image is that Plato uh, differentiated these things, imaged them as the chariot and the charioteer. And the the chariot uh, with the horses is passion. 
Uh, and the charioteer is uh, an image of, of reason or ego and control. And how do those two things work together or how are they at odds with one another? Be- because this dichotomy, so to speak, between reason and feeling is as old as man. We have these two different systems, an emotional system and a sort of frontal cortex system. And we don't often pay attention to what's coming from where. And then, as you were saying, Lisa, how do I think about what I'm thinking about this? Mm -hmm. Are the horses running away with me? Uh, or is the charioteer being over controlling? Uh, how do they? How are we working with ourselves? You know, though, I, th- I think it's not quite that. It's not quite as clear as kind of thinking and emotion, right? Because to add another uh, metaphor here, <laughs> you know, Jonathan Haidt in the Righteous Mind has this other metaphor about the rider and the elephant, <laughs> and you know. <laughs> Uh, re- research uh, shows that we think we're thinking, but usually we're feeling. <laughs> and then we come up with a clever way to rationalize yes. our decision or our action mm-hmm. without even being aware that that's what we're doing. So that yeah. we're actually, we actually are being driven more by emotions. And But I think that, um, you know, sort of the insight that, how we think can affect how we perceive things that that is a really valuable insight and and again i think it's one of the chief it's sort of the insight upon which cognitive behavioral therapy rests that you can think about things in ways that aren't accurate or you can think about you can you know catastrophizing is a perfect example you know you failed a test and then you tell yourself, well, that's it. I'm going to fail out of college. <laughs> then I'm never going to be able to get into graduate school and I'm going to be homeless. You know, and I, <laughs> I, I, no, but I mean, I, I, I talk to people who, I mean, we all catastrophize, right? And it's, it's a good thing to catch yourself doing, but you, you can, what, what happens is there's this kind of interplay between emotion and thought where you're upset because you failed the test and out of the upset state are generated very upsetting thoughts like i'm going to become homeless because i'm going to fail out of college and never you know you know ridiculous but that can make you feel worse so you do have to attend Mm -hmm. to the quality of your thoughts and kind of test them um so it's it's there's a complicated interplay you know how we feel uh affects how we think and how we think and what we think affects, affects how we feel. But it's, it's not entirely clear cut. And it's, there's a kind of interdependence of those things. Mm-hmm. I think there's a big difference between thought and attitude. And Jung mm-hmm. really felt that that was very, very important. That thoughts are like birds that seem mm-hmm. to have a kind of temporal presence. They, things fly in and fly out. And that they can be precious. Jung was really dedicated to grabbing thoughts, particularly if they were helpful to what he was writing. And attitude is another level of thinking that has become a belief. Mm -hmm. That is, that is a foundational thought Mm -hmm. upon which many other things are built. And so much of what we do in all the psychoanalytic traditions is trying to create a condition where a new attitude a new foundational thought yeah. could could become present. That's great. Yeah, that's a great way to describe it. Yeah. So we have as our foundational beliefs, we have stories. We mm-hmm. have stories about what's right, what's good, uh, what what you're like. We have stories about identity and values and goals and uh, kids, we get told, "Oh, you're you know you're really really good at music," uh, or you're not really good at math, uh, and we absorb these stories without the capacity to think reflectively about them. Uh, depending on our homes, our childhoods, our 
you know, cultural surround, etc. A- and we also have buried stories, mm-hmm. uh, stories we're not even aware of, um, also known as secrets. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they're just implicit in our families, schools, religious institutions, whatever. Uh, and they've never really been raised to consciousness, but nevertheless, there they are operating in the background, uh, shaping what we do, shaping our decisions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, they're just they're just sort of like implicit mm-hmm. assumptions about the way the world is or about yes. who we are. Yes, uh, and it goes down hard when uh, some of these implicit stories about uh, things like fairness and, and goodness, uh, morality, uh, are, are challenged out there uh, in the so-called real world. And so we have narratives in many different domains mm-hmm. around us, some of, which are temporal, some of which are temporal and some of which are foundational. One of the things that we work with so much as analysts is the narratives that have to do with self-identity and coherence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That, that we have a, a story about ourselves, which is, can affect all kinds of things inside of ourselves. And some disorders, like a borderline personality disorder, where there is this constantly changing self-narrative, and so the yeah. identity can feel very unstable as mm-hmm. the narrative shifts based on intense moods and what we happen to remember and what we happen to forget. And that mm-hmm. kind of overly fluid shift of narrative can create an enormous amount of anxiety inside of us. So we do need a, a story about our past, our present, and our future mm-hmm. that we are able to hold reasonably in memory so that we don't feel disjointed. Mm-hmm. Well, and, you know, Jung helpfully offers this idea of the complex. And I think that when ah. we're in a complex, one of the things the complex does is the complex comes with its own story. Mm-hmm. And it's like when the complex gets constellated, that story gets activated, and that story might be really different from our usual story about ourselves. So for example, let's say that we had some situations in childhood that felt abandoning. And so we kind of have an abandonment complex. And most of the time we feel okay about ourselves, but when our abandonment complex gets triggered, uh, the story goes something like, "I'm, I'm not lovable, no one will ever care for me, and and it's like a distort it's a distortion right it's not true and we have a lot of evidence to the contrary but when when we're in the complex we really really believe that yeah and so that's why you know let's say that you have this abandonment complex and a friend uh cancels on you and you you go into your abandonment complex and you're like oh she canceled because she um uh, because I'm I'm fundamentally unlovable or whatever. You have kind of like an outsized, inappropriate uh, response to it. That's one of the ways that you know that you're in a complex. And then, you know, later on when you've sort of recovered from it, or maybe you've had a chance to speak to your friend and have your incorrect assumptions, you know, corrected, uh, then you might be out of the complex again. You might, it, and it might seem strange that you felt that way. But, you know, Jung said that complexes were kind of splinter personalities. And, and part of the way they affect us is because they come mm-hmm. with an embedded story. I like the idea of thinking of the complex as a kind of sub-narrative mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. suddenly becomes, uh, takes the main stage. Mm-hmm. And then that becomes uh, my story of being abandoned all the time and in numerous <laughs> circumstances. And then all the other acts of the play kind of fade from memory and how mm-hmm. um, incredibly disturbing and painful it is yeah. to trick ourselves into thinking we have only that narrative while we're in the complex. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think uh, job one with that, you know, working with somebody in the consulting room or 
an intimate conversation with someone uh, is to say, wait a minute, you know, you were feeling really, really bad. You felt abandoned. You felt rejected. You felt unwanted or unimportant. And that's a hard feeling. It really hurt. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the friend who canceled lunch or something at the last minute finds you unlovable or uh, not worthwhile. That that's the story. Mm -hmm. So your feelings are legit. You were hurt. It, you were looking forward to it. It was disappointing. Uh, but in order to find out the story, you're going to have to check with that person, you know, who canceled at the last minute. Uh, you know, what if something happened in that person's life? Uh, what if it has nothing whatsoever to do with you? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so pulling those two categories apart um, after the, the heat of emotion uh, mm -hmm. has, pa has passed is, uh, is the task. This is what I felt. It's totally legit, and that's category one. Mm -hmm. This is the story I created. I don't know if that's really out there in the um, external world. Is that really the story? Mm -hmm. Probably not. And that goes to that wonderful distinction between an event and a story. Yeah. yeah. The event is I'm sitting in the restaurant. It's 1230. <laughs> my friend said they would be there at 12. That's an event. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, just the way mm -hmm. dreams are set up like Greek dramas, we have a tendency to need have a story about mm -hmm. that, which of course gives it meaning. Yes. The meaning can be generous or the meaning can be uh, negative, or the meaning can be frightening. Some people will sit there and tell themselves a story, oh, my friend must have gotten to a car accident, mm -hmm. or that I'm no longer loved, or I was forgotten, yeah. or some other story that perhaps is much more resilient. Like, oh, right. you know, my friend, she probably just lost track of her calendar, so I I'm going to sit here and make friends to the person, you know, to the left of me. And we're going to have, <laughs> you know, bolognese, you know, and wine. Uh, but the, the discovery that we can self-author mm -hmm. is, yeah. is a radical uh, thing. Yeah. yeah, We have some yeah. control, as you were both saying early on in the introduction, is once we realize that, that we're going to either unconsciously author the moment or we are going to consciously author the mm -hmm. moment, is, is a revelation. So I want to just um, offer a couple of personal stories about this, um, one of which I'm going to be annoyingly um, obscure about because I, I just don't, I, I'm just not going to reveal a lot of personal information. But there was a time a, a number of years ago when a person important to me uh, asked me that I just kind of make a change. And, and the, it, it hit me, it was in some ways a minor change, but it hit me like being, I don't know, like punched in the gut. I just was so mm. upset. And I, I think I intuited that it might have big, uh, big consequences. And, and I was r really, really upset. And then uh, like literally 30 seconds later, I thought about the upside of the request and there were considerable upsides of the request. And when I thought about it that way, like my, my heaviness lifted around it. And I was like, oh, well, this is great. I'm just going to kind of go with that. I'm going to go with this positive framing of it. And that was good and that was helpful. But I will tell you, years later, it kind of came home to roost. And my initial sort of gut punch was, I mean, yes, there were good things about it. But, but my initial reaction to it was true. Do you know what I mean? Like there were consequences to it. So I, I, I've, I thought that that was a very interesting experience that I've thought a lot about because because I could see how the story I told myself about it at the moment radically changed how I experienced and allowed me to go forward with a lighter heart mm -hmm. and also obscured the emotional truth that I had when it first mm -hmm. hit me. So it's kind of a both and. And then I'll, I'll tell another story, which is a little bit um, lighter. But a week ago today, I was in London trying to get to Heathrow Airport to catch my <laughs> flight. And I was on the Heathrow Express, which I will never do again. 
Anyway, it, um, <laughs> all the trains were stopped. Uh, there was like a problem on the tracks and all of the trains were stopped. So we're just sitting there, you know, they have no information and the British are so, you know, the conductor's like, I'm so sorry. I wish there was something I could do, you know, and you're just like, so I, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm on the train and I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm beginning to get that I'm going to miss my flight. And so uh. I start to kind of process this and, and I'm, I'm telling myself, you know, kind of be resilient, Lisa, like this is, this is the worst case scenario here is, I don't know, you spent, you wind up spending money you, you didn't want to spend, you know, but it's, it's not a life changing amount of money and it's, you know, yeah, and it's a pain you get home, you know, a day later or whatever it is, but. But, you know, just, uh, you know, I was trying to do this. I was trying to kind of give myself the resilient narratives and, um, oh, you know, it's better to leave Heathrow first thing in the morning anyway, or whatever it was. But I have to tell you, my nervous system was having none of it. Yeah. I, I was trying really hard to kind of talk myself down from a very anxious place. But at the end of the day, that was just like, yes, I was saying all the right things in my head, but damn it, I was really <laughs> stressed. And uh, so, so I, I mean, I don't want to overstate, you know, the ability yeah. to sort of, oh, well, we have to do is think positively and then snap, everything's great. No, it, it, it's a little more complicated than yeah. at least in in my experience. So it's it is hard to keep calm and carry on, uh, <laughs> as as the Brits famously say. But uh, and I can certainly I can certainly get that of, you know, there's something awful about uh, the prospect of missing a flight. You know, and you know, there are going to be other airplanes, you know, you're not going to be stuck in London for the rest of no. your life, which wouldn't but, be the worst thing in the world anyway. <laughs> but, but the feelings r run away yeah. with us. It's yes. it. And I think that's just true. I think mm -hmm. there are times that, um, you know, anxiety or, or shock or a hundred other things uh, feelings are strong and they're powerful, yeah. Yeah. and uh, so, so it. But it can help. I'm asking and imagining that it at least helped you to know that even though you couldn't talk yourself out of the feeling, it was only a feeling. Yeah. It didn't mean yes. that you were going to be stuck across the pond for the next decade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, it's true that, um, first of all, at some point I started laughing like really hard about it. Like it just, it just got hilarious. I mean, I have this text thread with the United representative that I am never taking off my phone because it's so funny. Um, and it, it, you know, just, it was like absurd trying to rebook on a flight. Anyway, I, I have read it aloud to a few people as like a dramatic performance and it, it has us all in stitches, but but so I was laughing about it. And I was also able, even in the midst of this very ridiculous um, experience with United, I, I was I was never rude, you know, because I mean, I think like that's one of the things, right, is when we get really worked up, our feelings kind of run away with us and then we can kind of act it out. And I think mostly I wasn't doing that, <laughs> even though I wanted to. <laughs> so. But what that reminds me is that um, the unconscious or the unconscious fantasy is already scripting things so quickly in the moment and sometimes in major arcs of our lives in that we have to first find the unconscious fantasy in order to deconstruct it before we can construct <laughs> something else mm. that perhaps is more insightful or adds additional information. And this is something that I've come to appreciate so much in our analytic work. Is uh, I used to just pause when people would say, "Well, what, what I'm really, what really concerns me is is thus and such," and then maybe there would be an amplification, or maybe that that would be challenged. Maybe it seemed silly. Maybe it seemed valid. But what I've started doing, which is so helpful. It's asking people to continue that fantasy mm -hmm. to its conclusion uh -huh. and actually lean into the fact that they really do, just below the threshold of awareness, have another bit. And then what would happen? Yeah. And what would happen? And if they can relax, there's a pretty full story 
Mm -hmm. just underneath the surface, which is often a, particularly if it's an upsetting story, is a maladaptive way to get to something. And perhaps the thing that they want to get to is not necessarily negative at all, but the unconscious strategy that they're holding as they get to it is very difficult. I'll use an example. Yeah, I was going to say, that'd be great yeah. if you have one. So um, this is quite some long time ago. I was working with somebody who is having chronic leg pain and uh, really severe, probably sciatic, probably a number of different things, but it was going on for months and it was just extraordinarily painful. And uh, it just occurred to me to ask as this person, as he was going from doctor to doctor to doctor, and then was saying, you know, I'm getting like two hours of sleep a night. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I suppose the Tylenol isn't working. And then he looked at me and goes, I'm not taking any Tylenol. <laughs> I said, oh, oh, well, well, what are you taking for the pain just so you can sleep a couple of hours? And looked at me and said, I would never do that. And I thought, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then we started the script. I was like, so what are you fantasizing would happen if you took the Tylenol? Well, but then I would wind up needing medication all the time. And then what would happen? Well, then it would just get worse, and I'd probably get addicted to Oxycontin. Well, and then what would happen? And then I would just <laughs> give up on life, and I would just lay in that bed for days. And then what would happen? Well, I'd lose my capacity to walk. And then what would happen? Well, then I'd have to be institutionalized, and I'd wind up in a nursing home. And this is where it got really interesting. Mm -hmm. And then I said, well, and then what would happen? And he went into this spontaneous reverie, and he goes, well... Uh -huh. I would get up really early in the morning mm. when no one was there, <laughs> and I would roll my wheelchair into the art room, Aww. and I would look out of this <laughs> enormous window, and all the art supplies would be there, and, the, and I, would, I would draw this magnificent artwork uh, of what I, had, what I was seeing outside the window, and, and they began to tear up. So we just sat there and I said, so you can't imagine liberating yourself from the enormous number of obligations and compulsive mm -hmm. working demands in order for you to give yourself an opportunity to take an art class, to set up a little art studio in your mm -hmm. house. And so the unconscious strategy is to refuse to treat the pain in your leg in mm -hmm. the hope that it will deprive you of your agency or your capacity to work so that you can be taken care of and then you can become an artist. Isn't there a different way to get there? <laughs> Isn't there a different narrative? Yeah. And that speaks to so how these unconscious scripts, narratives are just below the surface and really influencing our choices, sometimes yeah. tragically. Yeah, yeah, that's really great. That is a really wonderful story that uh, really epitomizes and illustrates uh, the Jungian concept of enantiodromia, uh, which Jung borrowed from one of the Greek philosophers. Uh, can you either one of you remember which one that was? Heraclitus. Thank you. That's it. Um, and if what Jung posits and Heraclitus posited, uh, is that one thing will naturally turn to the other. This is a different concept from the pendulum swinging in the other direction. The concept is that out of a powerful state, that state will actually generate its opposite. And by following along and following along and following along with the disaster, scenario uh, that this man, you know, you know, hadn't unpacked fully. Mm -hmm. It led to something that Psyche really wants, uh, wanted access to creative expression and freedom. And we were barking up the wrong tree, <laughs> looking at, oh, the somatic problem with the leg. And, and so he just started taking some Tylenol. He was getting six hours of sleep a night. He felt much more optimistic. 
actually found the right person, found an osteopath, bum, bum, bum. The pains, you know, was cut by 75%. But he had to make a deal with his unconscious, yeah. which is, you know, we'll fix the leg, but you've got to find another way to the art room yeah, so that the unconscious doesn't trick you mm-hmm. into getting its needs met. So the story had to be discovered or the thought had yes. to be discovered mm-hmm. so it could then right. be deconstructed and honored and options could be offered. And that's yeah. so much of what therapy in general is, is discovering where the bias is and then discovering there are many different options that are possible. Mm-hmm. And and I think, you know, it's true that uh, this idea about, you know, what are the stories we tell ourselves? What are our maladaptive core beliefs? What are uh, some of these logical fallacies that we engage in? I'm using all of this kind of CBT language, which is all really valuable. But I think the depth psychological approach goes deeper because what we are saying is it goes beyond just... Mm-hmm. maladaptive core beliefs or, you know, kind of, uh, you know, we're thinking we're catastrophizing or we're, you know, thinking the wrong thing and just saying, no, there are deeper narratives that arise not from the conscious mind, but from the unconscious. And those don't just need to be corrected necessarily. They need to be engaged with so this idea that I can just correct my thinking as I did when I had this uh, kind of upsetting request from mm-hmm. a loved one, uh, yeah, it worked in a way, but something else got jettisoned or forgotten mm-hmm. about that might have actually been useful to engage back then. So uh, that's, that's a really lovely story, Joseph. The other thing I want to put on the table is um, 12-step programs. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. many of us that have um, maladaptive behaviors, whether it's alcoholism or heroin addiction or compulsive overeating, let's take alcoholism. I've had many recovered alcoholics in my practice and found them to be incredibly insightful, yeah. wise humans. That One of the reasons that they go to the AA program is they need to tell the story of their alcoholism and the consequences of it, and hear other people tell that narrative because something inside of them wants to justify drinking again because on a certain level it was so pleasurable. Mm. So reviewing the full narrative of consequences allows them to situate themselves in right relationship to the addiction. And there is something about the, the gods of addiction make us want to forget Mm. and then minimize the destructive potential of something. So sometimes the story we tell ourselves can be painful, but the Mm. suffering in our stories is often the part that's transformative. Mm -hmm. Mm. And then there's maybe something that's the opposite of that, which is, I think we can, we can ruminate, which is something I'd love to do a whole episode on, by the way. Yes. But I, th- I think that, um, you know, sometimes to go back to catastrophizing, what something will happen. And, you know, like, let's say, for example, that I'm on this train to Heathrow and it stops and I realize I'm going to miss my flight. So then if I were going to um, catastrophize, my thoughts might be, I'm going to miss this flight. I'm going to have to cancel all of my uh, hours tomorrow. I'm going to miss a whole day. Um, then maybe my clients will be angry at me and they'll, they'll, um, they'll terminate treatment or you know, any number of these kind of catastrophe stories that I could have told myself about it. And what we can do when we're upset, we're sitting on that train, there's nothing else we can do. Right. A part of it is other than talking to United, I really just had to sit and accept what was happening. I couldn't get off the train and start walking to Heathrow. There was nothing to do. So uh, what we can tend to do in those cases is to ruminate on the negative stories like, oh, no, well, if I have to cancel all of my clients, they're all going to terminate with me. And that means that I'm not going to have enough money to pay my bills. I mean, I could really go to town. Right. 
And so we can tend to do this. And sometimes when I'm working with someone and I catch them doing this, you know, there's a lovely Irish expression that's like, well, don't meet the devil halfway. <laughs> that's one way to think about it. But I, there's a metaphor that I use for it. I, I say, look, it's like you're walking down the street and an old beat up car pulls over. And in the driver's seat is a, a, a kind of a scary looking dude with a baseball pat. And he says, get in. Don't get in the car. That's my, my funny story <laughs> for it. Because if, if you have a frightening thought like, oh, no, all my clients are going to end treatment and then I'm, I'm not going to have enough money. And, you know, that's like that's like getting in the car. You don't want to go for that ride. You don't need to go for that ride. You can say, no, thank you. I'm not getting in the car. And hilariously, one of my clients who has um, sort of obsessive compulsive tendencies laughed when I said that and said, yeah, but the thing is, he just drives around the block and comes back again. <laughs> Which is true, of course, you know, but, but I think we can choose not to go on that ride. Yeah. It's like when those thoughts right. occur, you can say, okay, I know what that ride is and I'm not going to go on that ride right now. I don't, yeah. I don't need, one of the things that I'll say to people when they're very upset, like let's say, you know, they're very, very distressed. They just lost their job or their boyfriend broke up with them. And and you, you, what will happen is when you get in one of those places, you'll start kind of narrating, you'll start being, well, no one's ever going to love me and I'm going to be single forever. And, you know, and, and I'll say to the person, I'll say, you don't need to decide that today. You don't need to think about what's going to happen in five years. You, you can just stay with your feelings and feel your feelings, which, you know, it's really sad, but don't, don't start, you know, in, in um, AA, they call it future tripping. Mm -hmm. um, don't, you know, but, but it's like, you don't need to make a decision. You don't need to decide how this happened. You don't need to decide when you're really upset. Don't try to think, don't try to make plans. Don't try to uh, do an analysis. Just be upset because you're not going to think well. And, and then those mm -hmm. thoughts are only going to make you feel worse. Yes. Uh, and, and that, so that's the temptation and that's the, the trick. Uh, that we're wired to play on ourselves. It's, it's very, very hard to sit on the train and just be anxious. Yeah, yes. It feels uh, better it, almost sometimes to ruminate. A mm -hmm. Absolutely, and to make up stories and that this is going to happen. And it's a, it's a false kind of comfort. And uh, to take your example about um, like a, a breakup uh, with a boyfriend. Of It's also very tempting to then say, you know, what, what went wrong here? What did I do right. wrong? And right. what did he do wrong? And ah, there were red flags and I didn't see them um, because he always did this or he didn't do that. Uh, it's a kind of false comfort because then you can fool yourself into thinking that you're doing something. Yes. Of, and now I'm figuring it out. And uh, struggling to create a narrative that makes sense so that my cognitive process can serve to hold my emotional distress right? versus I'm just distressed, I'm upset, I'm hurt, I'm terribly disappointed mm -hmm. uh, and sad. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't like to be just stuck with our feelings <laughs> on a train, on a train, whether <laughs> it's the, the emotional breakup train or the train to Heathrow. <laughs> but, but, yes. but now Midnight we, train to Georgia. <laughs> but we all need to know, did you make the plane or not? Oh, no, I missed. I missed the plane. Oh. And, it, and what was so funny is um, there, there was another plane two hours later. Um, okay. Uh, and I was trying to get booked on that one. And literally the train started moving. We pulled into Heathrow. I'm uh, jogging along in Heathrow trying to get to the gate, still <sighs> not booked on the next flight. So I'm like literally standing in front of that little kiosk where you're checking in, like waiting for them to say, okay, you're booked. But in the end, it all worked out. It all worked out. And you know what? The later flight back was kind of a bummer because I got in quite late. <laughs> However, the later flight was so empty that I had three seats to lie across. Oh. So in the end, it worked out better. Absolutely. Life so. is in your favor. Well, yeah. there's, there's usually yeah. a, a good way to look at things too. Um, I want to just um, 
go to uh, the work of Byron Katie, if anyone is familiar with her. She has, these, she has this thing that she calls the work, and there are four questions. Ah. And the, the questions are, is it true? So okay. it's either yes or no. And then the second question is, can you absolutely know that it's true? So let's say that your uh, friend stood you up for lunch, and the, the fear is, um, I'm unlovable. Is it true, yes or no? So maybe you say, well, yes, it is true. And then question two is, can you absolutely know that it's true? Which I think, Joseph, goes to some things that you talk about a lot. You know, it's like, do I really have any evidence that this is true? What is the evidence? Can I, can I know this for certain? And so a lot of times it's like, no, you can't. And then, and then the next question is, how do you react? What happens when you believe that thought? So how does that thought influence your actions, your beliefs? And then the final question is, who would you be without that thought? Ah, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I like the, um, there's so many good things in that, have that as a bit of a protocol, because it evokes the observing ego. Yes. That, that some other part of us is able to look down and ask questions that are not inherent in the moment. And that gives us breathing room not just by answering mm -hmm. those, but breathing room in many other places we might go just questioning. It's a kind of um, an invocation of a metacognition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. reflective capacity. Absolutely. And it gives us the ability, which is very helpful, to step out of our the feeling and being caught up in uh, a complex or a lot of emotion, at least you can know that there is another perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, it may, it may not sort of uh, have a lot of emotional resonance in the moment of, you know, if you've just broken up with somebody or you're stuck on the train to Heathrow. <laughs> but, but at mm -hmm. least you can know that there is more than one facet to this. Uh, and that in itself is, I think, a huge comfort. At least you're not all caught up uh, in, in the whirlpool of the emotion and the meaning and the thinking that all get mixed in together. It's like having a big feeling, I can't really think about this right now, but at least I know there are other possibilities. I'd also like to mention the, the power of narrative and storytelling relative to our relationship to the collective and our relationship to other people, mm -hmm. which is something that has, in one way or another, has become so powerful in the world of social media that, that we manipulate, consciously or unconsciously, manipulate personal narratives to serve various psychological needs. So we create envy posts mm. on Instagram so that we can try to maintain <laughs> self-esteem. That uh, we demonize our ex-husbands and wives as a way of justifying our past behaviors mm -hmm. or, or preemptively protecting against criticism. We tell stories of devaluing mm. um, our bosses or companies we were fired from. So we have a sense of minimizing any feeling of loss in mm. ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, we slander people and tell a narrative um, in order to somehow express our anger or our need to be powerful. So I think we live in a world right now where stories about ourselves yeah. and stories about other have, have taken on a kind of power that is extraordinary mm -hmm. um, and incredibly distorting. Yes. It's one thing to sit alone and say, mm -hmm. oh, I was mistreated. It's another to get 500,000 other people saying, yes, you were. Yeah. And, and yeah. how much voltage is added Mm -hmm. to our, our little coping mechanism that way and how difficult it is to step 
back. And once you've yeah. got 500,000 people mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. Instagram screaming your story, yeah. how do you unwind that? Right. And you realize that you were just in a bad mood or you were just resentful because something didn't work out. It, yeah. Yeah. It, that really speaks, um, you know, to what you were talking about, Lisa, of can you know it's true? Mm -hmm. Is it true? Can you know that it's true? Uh, and how uh, infused some of these things are with passion and emotion and with mythological significance. Mm -hmm. um, you know that, that they, whoever the they happen to be, are out to get you. And they, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And we're susceptible to those kinds of the mysteries of the gods that there are forces out there. And if we read that there are, I don't know how many thousands of people on some social media channel, you know, that all believe that, my God, the sun is starting to rise in the West, uh, it taps into that part of us that is like, whoa, um, oh, my God. Uh, we live in a crazy world. This would be the craziest thing ever, but it could happen. A and we have to go back to, is it true? Can you know it's true? Can you take the time to check out other sources? Uh, step, step back from it a minute. Uh, you know, that objective, verifiable data is um, foundational in the interpersonal work of Gestalt. Uh, and in the training I did years and years ago, you were never, never allowed to start a sentence with the word you. Uh, you always, and then you never, and you would even, the only time you could start a sentence with the word you is when you were reporting objective, verifiable, observable, behavioral, inarguable data. Uh, you just blinked your eyes. You are breathing in and out on a regular hmm. basis. <laughs> and so I'm um, going at this from a couple of different angles of, is it true? Can you know that it is true? Do you have other data uh, to break the very strong tidal pull of feeling, personal feeling and anxiety, and that mythological substrate that is very powerful? Can you step outside and go, wait a minute, wait a minute, do I know that it's true? And, 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 can I really trust that? So, and I think it comes up over and over and over again in the consulting room is mm -hmm. the feelings are real. Mm -hmm. Your feelings are very, very real. You know, honestly, if you're worried about a giant meteor hitting the earth, you know, or any one of a number of things that's distressing, it is distressing. Um, your story about it is a different, that's just a different category. You know, I, I want to just maybe lift it into a slightly different register here as we approach the end, which is um, stories, as, as you've said, Deb, are just an inherent part of being human. We're just wired that way. And uh, stories are important for connecting us with the sense of meaning and belonging to the cosmos. Mm. They can be ennobling. We need, I think, grand narratives that give our life meaning, purpose, and shape. And, and so there's that element of stories too. And I think that when we find, you know, when we feel particularly moved, for example, by the stories contained in the world's great religions or by a mythological story or by a wonderful movie or a, a, a novel or by history, fairy tale. you know, a fairy tale, then, then, then we, we have placed ourselves somewhere in, in the, in the human story. 
and and stories can be are, are absolutely essential, I think, in that sense. Well, perhaps this is a good time to transition into a dream, which is another kind of story and yes, we it often is. find yes. ourselves inserted to right. somehow. Yeah. And uh, before we move to the dream today, I just want to remind all of our listeners about Dream School. If you're interested in uh, learning to work with your dreams the way that we work with dreams on the podcast, we can help you do that. So Dream School is a self-paced, interactive 12-month program. There's a live component. You get to be with me, Deb, and Joseph. We each do something live every month. And uh, it's also a wonderful yeah. community. So you can take a look at this jungianlife.com and just uh, scroll down and you'll see a button to learn more about Dream School. So t- today's dream uh, comes from a woman who's 30 years old and works as a writer, and she has titled her dream because it is a story. We ask people to title their dreams, Lost Cat. And here's the dream. I'm in school again. I learned that this semester we're reading a book that in real life I helped to adapt during the height of the pandemic. She notes that she's a screenwriter. I have a sense of dread because while I've read it many times before, Despite my knowledge, I never connected with it. The class takes a field trip to my childhood home. I dream about my home often. My mother lost it abruptly to bankruptcy when I was 19. A thick snow covers the ground. I open the back door and a cat runs out into the snow. I call for it and then realize that I'm calling the wrong name. Irina? Ivanka? I can't believe that I can't remember its name. I feel a panic that I have lost my childhood cat. Every time I call out the wrong name, another animal shows up. And soon I am surrounded by (laughs) cats and dogs and goats and chickens. But none of them are her. I get increasingly desperate and sad, certain I've killed the childhood cat. Then I wake up. After a year, and I'm sorry, here's the context for the dream. After a year without work due to the writer's strike, I got a job as an assistant to a writer that I have worked for before. We have had candid conversations about his desire for me to have more creative say and autonomy than in the past. But I fear that I will not be able to transcend Mm. the subservience of the role, something I have struggled with in the past. It feels like a regression to take another support staff role at all. The main feelings in the dream were panic, guilt, self-flagellation, and disbelief. How could I not remember something so simple about my past, that Mm -hmm. the cat's name? And for additional context, she notes, leaving my small town in Michigan for a selective East Coast university was the defining part of my young adult life as I was very devoted to my studies and think often about the significance of education to my early identity. The loss of my childhood home felt in many ways like the end of my childhood. I had seen my father die of a heart attack when I was five, outside the back door that I mentioned in the dream. When my mother lost the home, it stirred up an anger in me that I would forget him. So there's so Mm -hmm. much in this dream and in the context, and I found it very poignant. I'm aware uh, that sometimes when encountering a, a dream like this one, of, of just one way to start with a dream that I'm starting from today with this dream, is I can feel the tears behind my eyes. Mm-hmm. So it, it's a clue of pay attention to how powerful the affect is that it feels like uh, I'm catching something from this dreamer. Of course, mm-hmm. it's resonating in me, but just when something like that happens with a dream, just pay attention to it. Of Something very powerful is happening here. 
One of the things that I notice about the dream, picking up in a, in a, on a slightly different note than you, Deb, is that it has two parts. It has a little kind of preamble, and then there's the main action. So we have to be curious about how those might be related to mm-hmm. one another. So there's the, she's in school again, which is an, a very common setup for dreams. And uh, she's, she's reading this book, and she has a sense of dread because she knows it really, really well, but she's never had a connection with it. And by the way, I'd be so curious what that book is. Mm. Um, uh, and then, boom, the class takes a field trip and to her childhood home. So, so I'm curious about the relationship between something that you've had to work on. You've had to, I mean, I, I would imagine adapting a book to a screenplay. I've thought about what would be involved in that. It must be uh, just a tremendous amount of work. Every time I think about that, it feels like, oh my God, that would be a huge amount of work. You must have to really know the, the book so well. You must have to read it and reread it and reread it. So she's done all this work on it, but she never felt connected with it. So there's maybe a kind of emotional mm. block there or something. And then there's this um, sense of not being connected with or fearing to lose connection maybe with the cat, and then we know from the context, possibly with this memory of her father. And I'm going, you know, to the part two or scene two, um, but a lot of loss of the lack of connection with the book, um, dreaming about the childhood home that mother lost abruptly to bankruptcy. And a thick snow covers the ground. And uh, water images are very powerful in dreams, and snow is a form of frozen water, which often relates to feeling uh, that something has been blanketed uh, in cold, pristine snow. So I'm, I'm having an intuition that I want to share, which I think builds on everything that we've just said, which is um, she's worried about losing the connection to her father. She's worried about losing, or, or at least that was her experience when she was 19. She's, in the dream, she's worried about losing the connection to the cat. I wonder a little bit if the meaning of the preamble, as I've dubbed it, uh, and alongside these other images, is that, you know, she lived the loss of her father. She was there. She saw it. She must have missed him. Um, And yet it may be that it was such an overwhelming experience that those feelings somehow never really got felt. And that would sort of map onto this idea that you know the book really well, but you never really felt a connection with it. So somehow she lived this experience, but there's some unfelt feelings around it and that's the both both in the dream with this the sorrow and the panic about losing the cat that the actual feelings but but also the fear of not finding it i mean cats are very feeling full animals so that there there would be some feeling that was never really fully registered or metabolized mm-hmm. from that period of life mm-hmm. Uh, The dreamer's uh, history, the loss of her father uh, at such an early age, and uh, then the missing masculine. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, mother and child and maybe siblings in the realm of the feminine, and cats are such a famous image of of the feminine. Marie-Louise von Franz wrote a, a book uh, sort of an exegesis of a fairy tale, but cats as images uh, of feminine feeling, of and that that's what is endangered. And the dreamer has lived that uh, with a you know presumably somewhat precarious uh, ability to keep a house that's finally lost, 
and maybe her job of being a, a staff writer a, again, uh, and the bankruptcy of losing the home, of, you know, an overall image of uh, precariousness. I'm taking in what you're both saying. Um, I find myself coming back again and again to that sentence. Every time I call out the wrong name, another animal shows up, and soon mm-hmm. I'm surrounded by mm-hmm. cats and dogs mm-hmm. and goats and chickens. Mm-hmm. And there's something so generous yes. in the psyche in that moment. Mm-hmm. That it's, it's not yeah. that she isn't being responded to. It's not like, psyche is ignoring her that all she has to do is call and this company this yeah. concourse of instincts comes happily yeah. to be with her yeah uh, and yet she, the only thing that she can see um is the thing that's lost mm-hmm. and i just want to hold how that can be for us and we were talking about perseveration earlier yeah that the idea of the lost part can and become so large in our psyche, and the the search for the thing that, and particularly I have lost, and I feel guilty about, and I feel responsible about. So she's got a story that I killed the cat. Mm-hmm. I opened the door, and I killed the cat. One, which one could challenge that narrative, because in the dream world, every Part of the dream is a part of her soul, and it has a telos. So what she might not realize is, you know, she opened or removed a barrier, so that this instinctive life in the house could escape, because it was meant to escape. It was meant to be freed mm-hmm. from the complex of the childhood home, and even though the ego is saying, "No, please let me stuff you back mm-hmm. in there." You couldn't possibly be okay for you not to be trapped in the childhood home. Something wiser inside of her, namely the cat, is like, hell no, I'm not going back in that house. (laughs) (laughs) Because whatever's going on in that house is not so great. And there's all kinds of life, as I said, around her that's incredibly responsive. And I have to say that if, if she wasn't so determined to stuff the cat back in the house, it might be happy to come back, but happy to meet her in the backyard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and the dream itself does not say that the cat has been killed. Yeah, exactly. The dream, the dream says the cat ran, uh, ran out and isn't coming back. Uh, and I love, you know, the generativity of the psyche, as yeah, you yeah. mentioned, Joseph, of, it's just got a whole barnyard now of, you That's know, the, one. I think mm-hmm. it's the old James Taylor song of when I call on your name, you know, wherever I am, I'll come running. So the goats and the chickens and the dogs and uh, all come running. Uh, and so it's worth exploring. What is that one thing that supersedes everything else? Mm-hmm. And and what we were talking about before, do I know that it's true that the cat has been killed? I don't know that it's true. Could be out skiing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it's. I was having this sort of intuitive feeling that somehow the dream was related to her work dilemma. And Joseph, you've helped me maybe kind of get there part of the way because, you know, the the point about her assuming, oh, I killed the cat. You know, that's absolutely so it. That is a particularly neurotic kind of um, tendency that many of us have, is something happens, we give it the worst possible meaning, and then we say, and it's our fault. <sighs> and my, my guess is that that may be uh, this, this dreamer's tendency to do that, because she mentions the term self-flagellation. And, and oftentimes that can be kind of a personality tendency to self-flagellate. And she also mentions having been very kind of studious. So this is all kind of in the realm of perfectionism as well. And of course, if that's where you're tending, it can be very difficult to 
attack a creative project with authority because you're, mm. you're too busy kind of scrutinizing everything that you do. So I, I wonder if that's part of what's going on with her finding it difficult to really kind of present herself in an authoritative fashion. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and uh, you know, and, and it's true, there is this incredible kind of creativity in the psyche that she can just kind of conjure up all of mm. these different animals. So there is a lot of wonderful, well, it's not exactly wildlife because most of these are domesticated, but there's a, there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of life in the psyche too. And, and it may be that there has been a kind of perseveration on what has been lost without seeing all of the richness that's there. I also want to just suggest that it's, she's, she has a fairy tale about the death of her father that is perhaps being scripted, the screenwriter in her, mm-hmm. that seeing or discovering she says she had seen yeah. the father die of the heart attack. Yeah, that's got to be hard. Which is a little bit like the cat running out the back door. Mm-hmm. That his soul just kind of ran right by her and out into the wild. And she was unable to stop it. And, and I think as children, we create all kinds of narratives mm. lacking sophisticated psychological theories. And so I could imagine a five-year-old seeing a parent pass away in front of them and thinking they had done something wrong. A hundred percent. Did I kill this? Should I have known how to do, save them? Mm -hmm. And then years and years later, I'm 30, but I should have done this and I should have done that because you can't, Mm -hmm. you can't remember who you were at five, of course. And so the going back home is to revisit it must have been a remarkable trauma, much of which is still unconscious. Mm-hmm. And the, I think capturing the feeling of being responsible for what has escaped the house, the soul in the father that mm-hmm. had escaped the house of mm-hmm. his body, and at five undoubtedly crying out into the yard for him to come back. Crying his name. Yeah. Looking for him the way children will. Yeah. Look for someone who's passed. It doesn't make sense. They're not there the next day when we come home from school. And part of her still calling out Mm -hmm. for him to return, even. Yeah. And as you had said, Lisa, if we step way back, think about it structurally, the father is the first anonymous figure. Mm -hmm. So if there's a sense that the masculine has escaped into the snowy field, has that changed the evolution of her own sense of internal masculinity, which then somehow inhibits that dynamic forward movement later Mm -hmm. in life? And the dream may be an opportunity to recognize that there are all kinds of dynamisms that come Mm -hmm. at her call. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to be in any way related to the loss of the father. And I think that's a beautifully said, Joseph. And, and certainly that tendency, the, of course, children have a tendency to believe that if a parent passed away, it's their fault somehow. That is universal. And it, it really does track with the cat got out, so therefore I killed it. Right. Oh, when we're kids, uh, correlation and causation are not differentiated. So, you know, we do this as adults too. Uh, You know, that when two things happen together, we we tend to create a narrative about how they are connected. Uh, You know, that when the heat goes off in the house, uh, you know, then uh, it may mean, you know, something else altogether. and that veers into all kinds of things that are, you know, strangely connected, like synchronicities. But kids are not, kids are not able to differentiate that. If you're five years old and you see your father die, uh, it has to do with all the complicated feelings that children have and, um, and a wish to make sense of things. 
And uh, those are feelings that kids need help to really process that is often not available because everybody is affected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's also a wonderfully educative moment. I find myself in this reverie of times when, even as an adult, my, my dog, got, I used to have this very spunky mm. little dog that I got from the ASPCA who just hated Bima. me. Or at Bima. Oh my, what a <laughs> scamp. You know, I would be looking out in the backyard for him and I would, it was a little tiny mutt, 20 pounds. I'd see him ba balancing on his tiptoes on the top of the chain link fence. And then ah. he would look back at me and then I'd see him sailing over the fence and out into the yard. And he would be like lightning. And that feeling of panic and responsibility. And then I'm like roaming around, calling his name and looking mm -hmm. for him. And I'm just sitting in that feeling and thinking to feel like that looking for your dad. Mm -hmm. It educates yeah. my soul about yeah. how, how a five year old might have mm -hmm. felt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the desperate longing and the hope mm -hmm. and the fear it conveys so powerfully. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what got me right at the beginning of, mm -hmm. of the dream of of that place that we all have of you know, this was just awful. Yeah. This yeah. and to really sit in that feeling. Uh, as an adult, is yeah. still very, very hard. To call and to call and to call, and and for all and of he's that never longing, coming back. collapse. Yeah. He's, he's never coming back. But dogs and cats and goats and chickens have shown up. Mm -hmm. There's new life. <laughs> Absolutely, you're not alone. Yeah. yeah, you're not alone. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living This Jungian Life.